You're right on time. To the second. I have to say that's quite impressive. Thanks. I'm glad you find my punctuality so fascinating. Is that a scotch? Excuse me? Your breath. What is that, a scotch? Yes, it is. Figured you for a vodka kind of a guy. Funny. How about you have a seat? So which one do you think I should sit in? Well, most of my new patients prefer the chair that's a little bit further away from me. I like to think there's something about the distance that puts them at ease. All right. I'll choose this one. That way we're nice and close. First session, Sean Garrett and Dr. Truss, Friday, September 3rd, 2010, 2.03 p.m. Are you going to talk like this the whole time? It's the only procedure. So where's your pad and pen? Oh, right. Why do you prefer that to the old pad and paper routine? I don't like to disconnect myself from the session by taking notes. I find there's a, a lot to be learned from someone's facial expressions, body language. I just can't capture if I'm taking notes. So where do you want me to begin? Uh, childhood, where I grew up? Sure. I'm from Long Island. I lived there all my life. I had a pretty fun childhood. My parents were the best. They uh, never split up. They never got divorced. They fought once in a while, but who doesn't, right? Sounds like you had a good deal of respect for your parents. You could say that. And what was it about them that made you feel that way? They never let rules get in the way of my fun. There was a lot of self-discovery. Would you like to give me an example? We never sat down and had a chat about sex, drugs, or anything like that. They just trusted that I knew what was best for me. And did you? As far as I know, yeah. Even though my recent history might say otherwise. A lot of people think my parents had something to do with what happened. Uh, they would try to find out if they did something terrible to me when I was a kid or something. And do you think I'm trying to do that? See, the other doctors would think they know what they're doing. They usually try to steer our sessions towards unlocking some kind of dark memory from my childhood. Something about you seems different from them, though. Well, you know, not everybody had a perfect childhood. I know. I'm not saying I did. So what is it that you disliked about your other psychologists? Nothing, really. Can't say that I actually disliked any of them. They're the ones that dropped me. And how does that make you feel? You know, doctor, we're sitting here talking, and it's great. We're exchanging words and phrases like, gentlemen, would you agree? Sure. See, the thing about the other doctors is we'll start talking, right? And suddenly they'll just pull out their cocks and start pissing in the wind. But you're something else. You haven't even managed to pull it out of your fly. You're just pissing all over your pants. And how does that make you feel? It was a joke. <laughs> a sense of humor. This is a nice surprise. I'm relieved. You know, most of my patients don't arrive here in a humorous mood. I could imagine. But you know I'm not just another patient, right? I'm the patient, aren't I? You are a rather high priority case. Why do I still feel like you're following procedure? Because I am. You know, making a joke and affirming your assumption was a gallant attempt to gain your trust and make you more open to confide in me. It was a nice try, but at least you're honest. So it's back to square one. Why don't you have another drink? Uh, maybe it'll loosen you up a bit. It would. But I won't. You know, Sean, I'm curious. Uh, what was your time in high school like? Did you play sports? Did you have a sweetheart? What? Forget it. No, no, no. Why refuse to answer the question? You know why. What are you trying to hide? What do you really want to ask me? 
Knowing what I did, you expect me to sit here and think you want to know about me playing baseball games and taking some sweethearts to the movies and how I did in school? What's so wrong about that? Because I know it's not what you want to find out about. I could tell. How so? Just the way you're asking me. It's your body language. You know, Sean, these sessions aren't about what I want to find out. These sessions were set up to help you. First off, these sessions weren't my idea. Either I keep going to these things, or they throw me straight in jail. Wait, whoa, whoa, I, uh, I you need- You don't need this, doctor. Hey, it's great you're making an attempt to learn about me in high school and try to find out about me and my parents, but why don't you let go of procedure just this once? Find out what you actually want to know. What do you say? There's going to be no record of this. Don't worry. If you're as good as I think you are, you won't forget a thing. You're right, Sean. I've read your file, I've seen the police report, watched the trial on television, seen the crime scene photos. And I know you think I have no idea where I'm going to go with this. But the truth is, I tried to prepare for this meeting the best way I could. Don't count yourself out yet. There's still plenty of time. Go ahead. Ask me. Do you think of yourself as a hero? Yeah, I do. I mean, you saw everyone outside of the courthouse and the signs they were holding up and the chance they were screaming for me. But not everybody felt that way. What about the victims' families? How do you think they felt? Or their neighbors, they're crying their eyes out, unable to finish the sentence before the news cameras. Victims? That's really funny. You know I did the world a favor getting rid of those low lives. Well, that may well be, but you still didn't answer the question. How do you think you impacted the lives of their families and friends? I probably crippled them for life. Crippled them? Doctor, there's only so many people that could face the realization of failure and overcome it, but not them. Failure? How do they fail? Well, people are a product of their environment, right? Children and who they become when they grow older, it's just a result of how they're raised, what they're taught, and how they interact with their peers. So when all of those people found out how their three little filthy animals died, they knew they were just as guilty as them. They knew the consequences of their failure. Their failure to be better friends, better teachers, and better parents to those three assholes. That's uh, somewhat ironic. Really? Yeah, if, if people are a product of their environment, then what does that say about how you grew up? You said you had wonderful parents, you had great schooling, you took girlfriends to the movies. Yeah, what's your point? My point is, how do you think your actions reflect the environment you knew? Doctor, I think you're starting to get the hang of this. You know, Sean, theories and assumptions only go so far. I mean, there's, there's countless stories about children who've grown up in the worst possible situations. They've been beaten, exposed to drugs and alcohol. Yet there's always still a few that can rise above all that and accomplish something profound. Some people say what I've done is profound. Would you like to hear what you've done? What are you talking about? I've heard it a million times. No, no, you, you, you've only heard what you choose to say. You've heard lawyers, reporters, the public put their spin on what you did. Let me tell you what you really did. Fine. First victim. Stab wound on the spinal column, and then a sharp penetration to the jugular. Second victim, a crushed windpipe, died of suffocation. Third and final victim, stab wound in the right eye socket, then a second stab wound to the navel. It is also noted that all three victims were castrated after they passed and had heavy bruising throughout their upper body and face. Victims? 
If I left them alive, they would have been called culprits. And it doesn't capture any of the uh, bravery or emotion in it. Sean, this is an interpretation of what you did. This is what you actually did. This isn't some story about a hero killing monsters. These were human beings, and this is what you did to them. Funny. They never mention anything about her. You mean the girl? Yes. Well, that's a crime scene report. She wasn't there when the police were investigating the crime scene. That's right. She left after. They found her three blocks away. I thought she'd get a lot further the way she ran out of there. You know, when the police examined her, they couldn't even tell which blood was hers and which was theirs. Why did there need to be so much blood? Because I wanted there to be. It wasn't enough just to stop them. How do you feel about what I did? It doesn't matter. Sure it does. What did you think when you first heard the story? I thought, uh, I hope they're okay, you and the girl. But to know what was right, I, I wouldn't know because I wasn't there. And when I hear people say, good for him, I would have done the same thing, I do get a little bit confused because how could anybody know what they're capable of doing when confronted with your impossible situation? Now, I'm not gonna tell you what you did was right or wrong, but I do think there's bigger things at play here. I get it. You're just trying to help, right? No, I won't lie to you. But you're supposed to be treating me. That's what the court said you're doing. No, I know what the court said. But to be truthful, I want to find out what happened that night, just like everybody else. No recordings, no notes, no TV cameras, no reporters, just you telling me what you need to say. Now I think we're getting somewhere. Are you sure you're up for this? I think so. No, there's no I think so. I need to know if you're up for this. Because I can see that twinkle in your eye now. Something tells me you had that look in your eye before. And it's been a long time since you had. I appreciate your concern. There's a difference between showing concern and giving someone a warning. A warning you. Is that really necessary? Yes. Why? Because this path we're going down, you may not find what you're looking for at the end of it. You may find that what you're doing may only lead you to frustration and disappointment. Then again, it could be something truly profound. All right, but if this is gonna work, you're gonna have to let me guide you. You're gonna have to trust me. All right. I want you to picture that night. Uh, think back uh, five minutes before it all happened. Do you remember where you were, what you were doing? I came from a small corner store. The mostly had alcohol, but after a minute of looking around, I was able to find some orange juice. Unfortunately, it was from Concentrate, but I was thirsty as hell, so I went ahead and bought it anyway. After that, I left. As I was walking, I tried to gulp down the worst orange juice I've ever had. Didn't even get through half of it before I threw it out. I was two blocks away from the subway when I saw it. There was this stray dog in the middle of the sidewalk, and it just kept staring at me. Weirdest thing. Why do you think the dog kept staring at you? I don't know. Maybe I thought I had food or something. But the staring wasn't the weirdest part. When it opened up its mouth at me, it had no teeth. Have you ever seen a dog with no teeth? I can't say I have. That's very unusual. When it closed its mouth, that's when I heard the screaming. And what's the first thing you remember thinking when you heard that scream? That there's trouble. It got louder for a moment. Loud enough so I could tell that it was coming from a close distance. And how long did the screaming last? Two, three seconds. Well, what about other people in the street? I would think the sound of a scream would attract the attention of others. You get out much? Every day? Then you know, they're all constantly connected. They're like a bunch of zombies out there. So what some people consider a real sound, other people just consider noise. Exactly. And after the screaming stopped, then you entered the alley? No, I, I turned towards the alley. I, I could hear struggling. Struggling? Could you be more specific? Whispers, whimpering. I could hear those low, incomplete senses coming out of her. 
please stop. And the crying, it was, it was constant. I couldn't take hearing that. Did it anger you? It empowered me to take my first step towards her. And what happened to the dog? He poked his head into the alley for a second, but it was a shy little fellow, though. As soon as I started staring back, it just ran off. And that's when you confronted the three men? No. No? Oh, why not? Because I was waiting. Waiting? I mean, you could see that she was struggling, yet you did nothing to save her from her agony? I didn't have a choice. I knew if I just ran at them, they would all overpower me. After the second minute passed. <laughs> yes, go on. I could see. She just became content with it all. She knew this was going to happen to her no matter how hard she tried to fight it. She accepted her fate. Do you resent her for that? Of course not. I resent everyone else who walked by that alley. If they just... Anyone could hear what was going on back there, if they just listened. Anyone who says they had no idea what was going on back there, if they didn't hear anything, it's because they didn't want to. And two minutes pass? That's all right. Then three, then four, then five, and six. What? It's all a matter of patience, Doctor. Patience and vulnerability. Explain. You said you've seen the crime scene photos. If you look, you know that the three men could have easily overpowered me. Well, Sean, time and weight are two entirely different things. I mean, those men were going to weigh exactly the same whether you waited one minute or ten. How long do you think it takes the average male to climax? I don't understand. Yes, you do. How long does it take you to come, Doctor? It's not something I bother analyzing. I would suspect all men are different. You are right about that. In fact, it takes a man an average of 2 to 15 minutes to ejaculate. You understand? So if three men were to have at it, it could take them anywhere between 6 and 45 minutes for them all to finish. Do you see the filth? Yet you chose to let this go on. You're not listening. I didn't have a choice. I was waiting every minute, calculating. And then what was it that prompted you to finally kill them? It's not what, it's when. Three predators indulging themselves, ready at any moment to kill anybody who gets in the way of their pleasure. Patience and vulnerability. When do you think three people like that are at their most vulnerable? Just before... Jesus. So that's how you were able to overpower them? I seen him drop his knife and stiffen his calves. So I snuck up behind them. They didn't even see it coming. And then I went for his throat. It was like cutting through burnt toast. I went after the second one. But I went for his stomach. And the knife went in too deep. I couldn't even pull it out. His screaming alerted the last one, but his hands were tied up right around her tiny neck. So I hit him in the face over and over. So I got her onto her feet. When she looked into my eyes, that's when I knew I still had more work to do. Do you really want to hear the rest? Where did you meet this girl? What? Risking your life for a complete stranger doesn't seem like something a guy like you would do. We don't know each other. Uh, she may not know you, but you know her. You can try to avoid this all you want, Sean, but no good's gonna come of it. Everybody thinks this is some random act of kindness, but I'm not so sure. It's the way you talk about her. She meant a great deal to you, didn't she? Nothing I said reflected that at all. 
Yeah. Right, yeah. People say an awful lot that never comes out of their mouth. That's why I don't take notes, right? It's the way you talk about her. Your eyes are very still, like you never have to think back to visualize her. She was very special to you, wasn't she? Are you sure you want to go this way? It could get very dark down there. Sometimes you need to go down a dark path to get into a good light. And when you look at the way you killed these three men, you can't tell me this is something you did out of principle. This was personal. It was two years ago. There was nothing really particularly remarkable about her. We were in a coffee shop. I like to go there every morning. They got the best muffins in the city. That's why the line is always out the door. So one day I'm there and I'm waiting and waiting. And when I finally get up to the counter, all the fucking muffins were gone. The bitch at the counter actually had the nerve to tell me it'd be another 20 minutes before the next batch was ready. <sighs> so this girl in front of me turns around. She must have heard me order. And she says to me, would you like to share my muffin? What happened next? We just talked. About what? Where we work, what our favorite muffins were. And to think, I didn't even know this girl existed until she shared her breakfast with me. Was there any attraction there? Any feeling of love? I don't know. I can't say that I've ever been in love before. We were just two people in a huge, loud herd. Because every time I go in there, all I hear is noise, but for one day, we were just louder than all that. You know, you're a pretty well-groomed guy there, Sean. I'm sure you got great taste in food, clothing. You're right on the dime. You see, that's why I can't understand why you'd settle for anything but the very best. Take the cafe, for example. You can get coffee and a muffin anywhere in the city, but you keep going back to the same place, even though you know you're going to have to wait in line. And I also get confused by the orange juice. The orange juice? Yeah, I, I think the only way that you settled for that orange juice is because you didn't know where you were. You were unfamiliar with your surroundings. You weren't just wandering the streets that night, were you? You were looking for her. Wait. What's the matter, Doctor? Then there was the stray dog. And yeah, here it is. Do you remember this one witness? His name was Harold Kimmler. Here, take a look at this, will you? Yeah, I remember him from the trial. No one could understand his testimony. It drove my attorney nuts. Yet there's no mention of this witness or the stray dog in any of your statements. Because it's not what anyone wanted to hear me talk about. Had you met this witness prior to the trial? You know, Sean, I think I know why you couldn't understand this witness. He didn't have any teeth. I know that now. Yeah. Sean Garrett. We're back to my full name again? And I thought we were going to be friends. I don't think you understand how dangerous you are. Enlighten me. You talk about people as if they're animals. Uh, pigs, zombies, a stray dog. You... Hear them making noises, but not real voices. In fact, the only time you talk about someone in a positive sense is when you're talking about someone who's done something for you. You know, like your parents who let you grow up exactly like you wanted to, or this young woman who shared her meal with you. She satisfied your hunger. But this was never about saving her. This is about three men taking something you believe belonged to you. I got great taste in clothes. Clothes, food, food. I'm, I'm a hero. hero. What I've what done, done is profound. profound. You're charming and quick-witted, but you've never been in love. Listen to me. You need help. You're not up for this, are you? There's only so much someone like me can do for you. You think everybody's below you, including me. This is why you see that homeless man on the sidewalk as a stray dog. Sean, you're no hero. Then what am I? 
You're a sociopath. That's why the judge saw no danger in you, why the jury found you so admirable. Because you're so good at hiding who you really are, even from yourself. Take it easy, doctor. You need to be in an institution. You have no idea what you're capable of. I can keep it all under control. No, no, you think these three men were your last? These are just the first of many victims to come. Don't count me out yet. You said it yourself. Not everyone's doomed from birth, remember? Sean, theories and assumptions don't apply to everyone. You are doomed. No matter how much therapy you receive, you're never going to be able to feel guilt, true emotion. You're going to keep hurting people with no feeling of remorse. Sick or not, my actions prove my worth. Society needs people like me. Uh, you can't be with society any longer. You're going to keep wandering the streets at night, searching out situations where this murderous rage of yours will be tolerated. There's nothing you could do to stop me from walking out of that door and living my life the way I want to. No, that's not so. I'm going to make out a report after we finish this session and give it to the judge. And tell her what? You've got nothing on me. You don't even record any of this. That doesn't matter. I write a report, make a profile, whatever it takes. I cannot allow you to hide behind your wits any longer. find my punctuality so fascinating. Is that a scotch? Excuse me? Your breath. What is that, a scotch? I want you to listen carefully and consider your options. You willingly admit on that recording that you were drinking before the session started. I had one drink to calm my nerves. And you're all about procedure, right? Then why would you shut off the tape recorder right in the middle of our session? You shut it off. Why would I touch your tape recorder? Can I stop playing games, Sean? I could tell by your frustration that you can see where this is going. You know what I am. You know what I can do. And there's nothing you could do about it. You can't touch me. Put what you've got in front of a judge, and I'll tear it to pieces. That may be true, but you know, maybe you're the one who's underestimated me. That would be something, wouldn't it? But do you really have the stones to put your whole practice at risk? Your life's work? Would you really risk putting your integrity on the brink of destruction? You'd be remembered as some washed up drunk who threw it all away. I'm not drunk. Sean, I've helped many, many people. There's nothing you can do to convince me otherwise. You know, you're very good at what you do, but so am I. I overpowered them, and I'll overpower you. I've been revered as the Good Samaritan. People buy me drinks just so they can shake my hand. You know, she thanked me for what I did. And you know what I told her? That it was my pleasure. That's enough, Sean. Come on, drink with me. Let's talk about baseball games and high school sweethearts. Time's up.